All right. Well, everyone, good evening. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, New Mexico, uh, friends from across the third congressional district, uh, as well as the entire state. And we really appreciated everyone from outside of New Mexico that has been joining us uh, for our Congress from my casa. Now, while I'm not in New Mexico right now, we're actually streaming uh, tonight from our nation's capital. Uh, we've been here doing some important work, uh, working on critical legislation and having important hearings. And so I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight um, to have this important conversation as we've been working to make sure that we're using every tool possible like telephone town halls, uh, video town halls um, like this one, uh, where we can have uh, conversations and keep everyone um, up to date with current information. And so just want to share with you that last night I did vote on some important legislation, uh, which we've all been talking about, and it's uh, the funding legislation to keep the federal government open to prevent a shutdown. And so not only does this funding package keep our government running, it also provided additional financial support in nutrition assistance for families and for children. And especially as schools are opening up um, safely, um, whether it's in-person instruction or distance education, this is gonna be another one of those important programs for our students, as well as for our seniors and all of those programs like Meals on Wheels or programs at senior centers. So just wanted to share that with you. Um, earlier this week, the house also passed the Bipartisan Strengthening America Strategic National Stockpile Act to increase access to critical PPE. Uh, we've all uh, gotten to know uh, and be familiar with that acronym, and that's our personal protection equipment. So face coverings, uh, rubber gloves, um, everything that our first responders and essential health workers and everyone is, every one of us needs as well. And then we also passed two important bills to combat the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous people um, that is something that's very important to us in New Mexico and across America. And so thank you all for your support with that legislation and every one of you that's been a part of that advocacy. And uh, look, as America braces for a second wave of COVID-19, and we've been learning this uh, from our public health experts, the strengthening of America's Strategic National Stockpile Act will prevent the dangerous medical supply shortages that we saw in the past that our country experienced at the onset of this pandemic and to help our healthcare workers protect themselves and their patients and each and every one of you. And I'll continue to push for additional COVID-19 relief for New Mexico's families. As you all know, we've talked about this a few times. It's now been more than 130 days since the House of Representatives passed the HEROES Act, which provides nearly $1 trillion in aid to state, local and tribal governments that's where the funding predominantly goes uh, for our EMS, for uh, our fire departments, for our police departments. Um, it's where uh, those funds are uh, available for local critical uh, public programs in our communities. And that's why it's important that we continue to fight for that funding. Also to make sure that we're fighting for additional relief like direct payments to people across New Mexico, uh, unemployment benefits for New Mexico's workers, and small businesses that are still struggling to get uh, that extension. So we need to fight for more PPP, for that uh, unemployment insurance that I just said, those direct payments of $1,200. Um, and so there's gonna be a lot of work between now and the time we're able to get that adopted. So please continue to reach out to our office and share your ideas and the importance of why these programs need to be adopted and passed. Now, the point of uh, today's conversation and the, one of the other areas that the HEROES Act also provided support um, and that it mattered is the delays uh, of the deadline uh, for the U.S. Census Bureau to deliver its census count. As you all know, um, the HEROES Act um, pushed back that deadline uh, so that we'd have more time to count, but it increased the 2020 census emergency budget by $400 million. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. On August 3rd, the U.S. Census Bureau announced it would move up the deadline to respond to the 2020 census by a month to September 30th. And it's a deadline that really uh, impacted us negatively in New Mexico because these counts matter. And that's why with just seven days away from this deadline of now September 30th to finish the census count, we're honored to have some uh, guests with us tonight that are part of our panel to help everyone understand the importance of responding to the census. 
Now, every one of you that's online tonight, there's no excuse. You can actually fill out that census while we're on this town hall. But we also want you to reach out to loved ones to encourage them to fill out the census as well. So tonight, I'm joined by Diego Trujillo, who's our census outreach coordinator for the San Miguel County Complete Count Committee. We're joined by Charlotte Little of the Pueblo Census, uh, who, or, who is our Pueblo Census Coordinator for New Mexico and our Native American Census Coalition. And Matilda Shendo, who is the chair of the Hemis Pueblo Complete Count Committee to discuss what's at stake for New Mexico in the 2020 census. So before I introduce them, um, again, if you haven't filled out the census, I want you to open up another browser um, and just type my2020census.gov, that's my2020census, C-E-N-S-U-S.gov. Um, it's not gonna take you more than 10 minutes to fill out your questionnaire, and then you can come right back and join us. So it's real important, just open up that census or that uh, additional tab and fill out um, that uh, uh, those 10 questions on my2020census.gov. So if you have already filled it out, thank you. Uh, because you're protecting funding and investments into New Mexico, you're making that count. Um, count, <laughs> and uh, again, to all of you that may be joining us tonight, that have been part of the census outreach in each of our communities, I just want to say thank you for your commitment to making things better in New Mexico. So, with that being said, I'm going to ask our panelists to make some opening comments, and I'm going to start with the introduction of Diego Trujillo, who has worked in local government for 22 years. And he's currently taking on two important roles, serving as our 2020 Census Outreach Coordinator for San Miguel County and the county's IT director. So if you're wondering how Diego is able to take all of this on, well, let's also say he's a US Navy veteran. So Diego, thank you for your service to our country. And also thank you for your service to our communities. And I'm gonna turn the floor over to you, uh, Diego, for some opening comments. Thank you, Congressman, for having me. What a pleasure to be on your um, town hall this week. Um, just as you mentioned, I'd like to encourage everybody to please participate sooner than later. As the Congressman mentioned, you can easily open another tab and go to www.2020census.gov and get that done um, in a relatively short amount of time. I think um, 10 minutes um, might be longer than it'll take. So. Um, Everyone, please take that time and get it filled out. We may only have eight days left, so um, get her done, New Mexico. That's right. And we're going to get into this conversation a little bit later, right, Diego, about why this is so important. So just thank you so much for being here and for representing San Miguel County um, and, again, for making a positive difference in our communities, and I look forward to hearing from you in just a bit. Um, next, we're going to hear from Charlotte Little, who comes from the Pueblos of San Felipe and Taos, and I've had the honor of working with uh, Charlotte for a number of years with one project or another and learning from her. For over 20 years, she's been part of efforts to build and strengthen voter blocks in Native American communities throughout voter education initiatives, get out the vote efforts and issue and candidate campaigns. Charlotte currently serves as the Pueblo and Apache Census Coordinator with the New Mexico Native Census Coalition, a collaboration of tribes, tribal organizations, Native American businesses and nonprofits working toward an accurate 2020 census count of indigenous people in the state. Uh, Charlotte, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here this evening and join you and join everyone on the panel. Uh, I've, as you, uh, the representative mentioned, I am the uh, working with the Native Census Coalition in New Mexico. It's my pleasure to help to provide assistance to the local tribal uh, CCCs, complete count committees. Without them, none of this would be possible, but we're happy to support providing them uh, administrative support, uh, uh, support with uh, media and uh, graphics and so on um, to help make their job easier. And it's also, I'm happy to see that Matilda is here this evening. So um, in addition to Diego's comments, I encourage everybody who, to, who has been waiting to complete their census to do so. And I wanna thank you and the state, the Indian Affairs Department for all of their support, all of the myriad of, of, of uh, organizations uh, providing funding to help get, uh, carry this initiative out, especially uh, the extended, over the extended period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you so much. And um, you mentioned um, the Department 
um, there as well. And we had uh, the secretary, Lynn Trujillo, on not long ago. She joined us as well for another important conversation. And we appreciate her work as the secretary um, as well. So thank you for that mention yes. as well, uh, Charlotte. Now, our third panelist today, um, as Charlotte mentioned here, was Matilda. And Matilda serves as the Tribal Enrollment Program Manager for Jemez Pueblo, in addition to serving as the chair of the Tribal Complete Count Committee uh, for the 2020 Census. That was a mouthful there, uh, Matilda. So I'm glad I got that out. Uh, Matilda Shendo has been a census liaison for Jemez Pueblo since 2000. This is her third decennial census effort. And I want to thank Matilda for her commitment and for her expertise that she's sharing with all of us. She has led the Pueblo's successful census efforts during the COVID-19 pandemic by employing advertising and incentives as uh, ways to increase participation. As a result, Hemas Pueblo ranks second in the nation among tribes for self response rates and is one of only three tribes in New Mexico to have 100% of non-response follow-up operations completed as of yesterday. So Matilda, thank you so much. And uh, any words of wisdom that you can share with us as we open up this important conversation, the floor is yours. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, having me on this panel tonight. Uh, I was totally surprised when I was asked to join you. Uh, I wanna thank Charlotte and the coalition for keeping us in order and providing to us the, the weekly stats of how Hamas is coming along. And I have to thank my tribal workers who have been working effortlessly, effortlessly delivering and now doing the follow-up. And my tribal administrative assistant is working with NARFU. And with her help and the other two tribal member girls working, we have a better understanding of who has completed it and something a little special that we've done with the American Indian Affairs money is we have um, bought $25 gift cards to Walmart and we'll be doing drawings until the 30th for at least um, 15, 12 to 15 head of household members for Hamas. And as of today, we have done 20 and we 20, 40, 60. We have 60 head of households. And that was my biggest job today was trying to call them to see if they had done it. But my NARFU workers were able to assist me to tell me that, yes, we did a follow-up. They're completed. And some of the people have gotten their gift cards and they are so excited. And I am very excited because in 2000, we had a 99.99 .99, uh, completion. And it, it's amazing to see this. And uh, like I said, it's all of Charlotte and the coalition. They have been keeping us going, um, having the meetings, telling us what to do, providing um, important information, mask, the PPC that PPE that we need. And it's just been outstanding. Thank you. Well, thank you, Matilda, and especially with your expertise and helping to push those numbers up and for getting to that 100% response rate and especially building upon that 99.99. Thank you so much. And your um, advice tonight and your direction is going to matter so much. So there's been a lot of talk, and I mentioned this in my opening comments, um, about our efforts to try to push the census deadline back so that it's not September 30th, but it would be October or, no or November. But to date, and as you pointed out, Diego, we're just a few days away from the 30th, just eight days away now, it doesn't appear that that's going to happen. So um, I don't know if you all have any thoughts that you want to share on that, but what advice do you have for those uh, that are listening in right now and that those that may be watching this on YouTube uh, tomorrow or the next day, what advice do you have to anyone out there that has not filled out their census? Diego, you want to share first? What advice do you have? 
Yes, Congressman, thank you. I'm hopeful we'll see a ruling in favor of the October 31st extension. With that being said, we can't wait until then to file. The time is now. Um, for those of you that have filed, the time has come where you need to encourage your family, your neighbors. Um, it's an all hands on deck moment right now. We need to encourage everybody, our coworkers, our cousins, our uncles, our aunts. Um, everyone we cross paths with over the next seven days, um, we should end our conversations with, have you filed your census yet? And um, all we can do is um, our best. And um, like I said, with eight days left, um, we need to do the best we can to um, ensure that we count everybody in our communities. That's pretty good advice, right? Begin the conversation with, have you filled out your census? And end your conversation with, have you filled out your census? It doesn't matter if you're at the grocery store, or you're at the gas station or you're going for a walk, whatever it may be, um, make sure that that's how you begin and end those conversations. Sound advice, Diego. Charlotte, what advice do you have? And maybe um, Diego or Charlotte or Matilda in your response, if you can also, and I'll go back to you, Diego, after we hear, hear from Charlotte and Matilda with what, how people can fill out their census. Um, I shared my uh, 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 2020 census as well. Um, but um, are there other ways? And you can even remind us of that website. But Charlotte, what advice do you have for everybody? Sure. Um, uh, I agree. Fill out your census form now, today. And uh, the three ways to complete the census is by mail, uh, online, or by phone. Uh, and if anybody is still wanting to submit their uh, questionnaire by mail, uh, you have, it must be postmarked uh, by the 30th of September, but uh, it's our understanding, uh, get it in just as quickly as you can. There will be a brief grace period for them to all be received at the two processing centers, but we're encouraging everyone to mail it tonight, tomorrow, put it in the mailbox. So those are the ways, uh, and I would agree with Diego, respond, respond, respond. Encourage your uh, friends, neighbors, uh, family members in different households, give them a call to it, ask them to do this. Young families especially, uh, younger families in New Mexico um, have are notorious for not completing this. We have a very young population. Uh, so include all babies. Anyone who, anybody who was here on April 1 in, this, in their homes uh, are to be included. Um, and so people wonder whether they should include a baby or not, definitely. Um, so that's what I would offer. And everyone living in that house, right, Charlotte? Right, correct. Right. So again, my2020census.gov, if you're yes. online right now and you've not filled out your census, uh, open up another tab, get that filled out, and then you can listen to us in the background and then come join us. Matilda, same question to you. What advice do you have for those who haven't filled out their census or need some help to get it done? Well, actually, that's kind of surprising because today when I was making the contacts to ask the people who were drawn if they had done their census, and the majority of them have, but they still had the forms that were delivered to the doorstep. And I told them that that's the one that was the most important piece of, of form that they could do. So the one person that I talked to was going to go grab it after work, finish it, and bring it to me so we can mail it. So as someone, uh, well, as stated earlier, they're saying, hey, this is completed. But we went one step further. Our governor, David Toledo, signed letters to tribal members who live off the reservation to make sure that they are counted and to put Pueblo of Jemez. So if anything, I would encourage those people to complete them, even though they're not in the lands, uh, Jemez will benefit from their returns. And um, I have helped quite a bit of people calling in because of COVID, we've had so many uh, different routes that we're going. So people are have done it online and I have to tell them to do it again. And I've thanked them repeatedly, but it's just been a very, very hard year. And I know that um, 
hopefully our numbers will be really high, even with those tribal members that are living off the Hamas land. So I would just encourage them to keep going and be counted. And that's what I say. Have you done your census? Yes, online. No, do the form one. That's the one that has your 12-digit identif identification number for your area. So we go back and forth, but hopefully with the flyers, the the uh, people working, my com complete count committee, we have gotten that message across. And as for the September 30th deadline, I, that was a shock to me. I had no idea that that had been pushed back this way. And it's, it's really causing a problem for us for trying to utilize the funds that was given to us by the Indian Affairs Office because, like I said, it was a tough year and we're trying to do the best we can. And our reward to our people is to give them incentives. So that's how I would, that would be my advice is continue on. If you haven't done it, please do it and count everybody. Thank you. Sound advice from our panelists with the urgency and importance of getting your census filled out. <clears throat> now, Diego, what, the next question that I have for you and Charlotte and Matilda is, we all know that the census is a critical count of who we are and what we need and where we live. And it's information that's critically important uh, to driving investments in communities across America. Now, when New Mexicans are not counted, how would those lost investments impact our communities over the next 10 years? If I have the numbers correct, Diego, I think what I, what I understand is it's $3,700 a year, which is 37,000 over 10 years, um, that would be lost. A 1% undercount in New Mexico is over $700 million that New Mexico would lose. And that's for schools, for different projects, for funding, after school programs, senior programs, infrastructure. So what are your thoughts with, with that question if, through your eyes and especially up in the community in San Miguel? If New Mexicans are not counted, how would those lost investments impact our communities over the next 10 years? Thank you, Congressman. Um, federal funding is not only critical to my county, but most counties in Northern New Mexico. Most of our counties lack industry. We don't have the benefit of revenue and um, from oil and gas um, resources. We are heavily dependent on tourism, ranching, and farming. Federal funding is most critical to our um, rural areas and those residents who have inadequate access to healthcare and lack emergency services. Um, those are the folks that need it the most. Every sector in my county depends on federal funding. Without it, we, can, cannot, we cannot continue um, to sustain our current in condition. Um, every sector in my county depends on federal funding. Um, so um, it's vital, it's critical to, um, like I said, every sector in our communities in Northern New Mexico. Um, the, the private sector and government uses census data to um, drive investment and that's critical to our areas. We need to be able to provide services to our smaller community colleges. Um, we need to provide adequate housing, adequate healthcare, not only to their staffs, but the students who come into Northern New Mexico. Um, we may very well lose these types of investments in our communities if we don't have the population and the data to support that, them. So um, it's critical not only to my county, but most counties in Northern New Mexico. I appreciate that, Diego. And earlier, before we went live, Diego, you were sharing uh, another anecdote um, that uh, helped you understand what this money means. And I gave the example of $3,700 per person, $37,000 per year or per, per decade. You share something else with me uh, about ten dollars. What, what was that? Yes, sir. So um, I received an email from Department of Finance Thirty um, of New Mexico explaining um, the losses in um, very simple terms today. Um, it's like walking by a ten dollar bill every day for the next ten years and not picking it up. I don't think very many of us would pass that ten dollar bill. I think we'd want to pick that up. So imagine that over every day over the next 10 years. That's what it means um, to our communities. That's each and every resident, $37,400. That puts it into perspective pretty good, Diego. I mean, I think that's pretty eye-opening. We can all get that. That, that. Thank you for sharing that as well. 
Charlotte, uh, the same question that I asked uh, Diego there, as far as what, when, if we don't get an accurate count, how will these lost investments impact our communities over the next 10 years? And especially with the responsibility that you have um, within our Pueblos and within our indigenous communities, what can you share with me? Well, uh, some of those impacts are, the impact is very similar to those that Diego talked about. But in addition to that, uh, services such as our Head Start program, uh, Title I grants to education agencies, um, uh, the Native American employment and training programs. We then move into the area of healthcare and nutrition. Uh, those services that are directly impacted can be, that could be directly impacted by an undercount are uh, our healthcare services uh, provided through the Indian Health Service and those that the tribes provide. Uh, Medicaid, uh, the Urban Indian Health Programs, and as well as SNAP uh, has a big impact on our children uh, in the area of housing, housing on tribal reservations. Having been a, a tribal administrator for my own community, we watch these through the Indian Community Development Block Grants, ICDBG, uh, and uh, the Indian Housing Block Grants as well. So those are a few of the critical pieces that can be at, impacted by an undercount. Thank you for that, Charlotte. Now, mm -hmm. Matilda, the question that I have for you, I'm going to go to the next one. Um, New Mexico, as we know, is the hardest to count state in the country. Um, and that's another reason why we need to make improvements with uh, getting more deployment of internet in all of our communities. Uh, but the question I have, Matilda, is, how is the public health emergency of COVID making the challenges harder that you faced <clears throat> in driving that count with HEMIS? What can you share with us that you had to face that made it harder this year to get that count where you have it? As I stated earlier, um, some of the events we had planned were cut because our Pueblo is still on lockdown since March and social distancing is, is still very active. And our tribe depends on whatever funds we can get. And so along with the uh, census count, I do the tribal enrollment count. So it is very important that I have accurate counts of people of all ages for our programs to request funding. So it's kind of interesting um, the way these two kind of go hand in hand, but Hamas is not a gaming tribe. So we have to depend on outside resources and it, it does affect us. And uh, I know for a fact that our tribe is gaining a lot from WIC and the the TANF or whatever they call it. We have a housing, we have the, I work at the health center and we have the medical emergency, the ambulance. So people don't realize the importance of it, but we try to educate them to tell them that if they answer the census, then at least it would provide funding for our programs to continue to go on. And with COVID being so active, I mean, well, not active, but hitting us so hard, thank God we have zero cases as of today. And it's thanks to the leadership because they have us on lockdown, but we are still able to get to the people through the phone, through the emails, and whatnot to, or even flyers at our checkpoints. So we're trying to get everything to the people so that we at least have done our share from our end. So I think that's hopefully the answer you were looking for. Yeah, well said, Michael. I appreciate that perspective. And Diego May I also offer uh, something really quickly to uh, those are excellent points of the activity of the direct impact that the local communities were uh, facing and many of our rural communities were also facing the same issue we're facing that uh, uh, the pandemic and this pandemic actually highlighted the need for those services 
uh, for healthcare services, for education, for Wi-Fi access, which is so limited, can be limited in our native and rural communities. Uh, it even happens in urban settings as well. I was under the impression that just about everyone had access to Wi-Fi to complete their census form online. And that's not entirely true. Very, uh, there's a lot of underserved communities as well who lack that opportunity. But in uh, shifting uh, our strategies during the pandemic, we had to move from one that was going to be very direct, one-on-one, -on -one, face to face at households in, at the doorsteps to one that was going to back up. We had to uh, pause for a, a very large period of time as was experienced by other communities. However, some communities were able to get their forms delivered through the mail in March, beginning in March. That didn't happen in our tribal communities and in some rural areas where uh, they called it, the operation was update leave. Yes, uh, that their forms would be delivered to their homes and that was delayed uh, for a very long period of time. And, many communities, it didn't really get fully off the ground till late June or early July. But we respected the decisions of our tribal leaders to protect and uh, the safety, the health and safety of their community members. So we did what we needed to do to shift it to, uh, to uh, make available flyers, banners, uh, social, we use social media, provided those tools for uh, the CCCs like that at Hamas um, uh, uh, to uh, change how we were doing things. And so we have a full, well, we have a group of part-time phone bankers who are making their way throughout the, the state by contacting tribal community members at each of the households. So that's how we've had to change. We couldn't do it the old fashioned way. I appreciate that, Charlotte, and especially your perspective that um, while there were challenges that everyone was facing with COVID to be able to get the count out, what we learned as well, uh, as you pointed out, with the lack of internet connectivity, not just in rural and tribal communities, but even in urban settings where um, I, I've had to remind a lot of our colleagues, just because there's internet available in a community, it doesn't mean everyone can afford it. And so when we're talking about access to high-speed internet, it has to one, be in a community, so we have to get that deployed and close that gap, but also make sure it's affordable. So well said, I, I really appreciate that. Um, Diego, so with what, the, with what you've been doing um, in and around San Miguel, how have you changed the ways you're reaching out to New Mexicans and encouraging them to complete the census with all that's going on with COVID? Thank you, Congressman. Um, San Miguel County CCC has had an innovative and aggressive campaign over the last five months. We have taken census to our residents. Um, I have approached management um, of our low income and senior citizen housing complexes and have held resident appreciation events. Um, that demographic, um, low income and senior citizens, is typically a hard to count demographic in our area. We were consistently able to file approximately 75% of those households in each of those complexes and took um, those tracks um, from low responding to um, mid-range responding. So um, that was one of the um, strategies we used to um, engage our residents at a whole nother level. We also engaged our larger employers and had employee appreciation events. All our events were incentive driven. Um, we would give all households um, anywhere from a pizza, an enchilada plate, or a Dairy Queen box lunch for simply filing their census with us. We also included a $100 drawing for that day's event. And as the months have gone by, we are including a um, $25 or $50 incentive for anyone who files at our events. So um, we like to think we've been thinking outside the box. It's extremely important in um, our culture that we engage our residents face-to-face. -face. That's very important. So um, we've taken that opportunity um, and done it to our best ability with the conditions we're having to deal with um, now with COVID. But um, I think um, we were able to file those that are the hardest to count 
And um, we'll continue to do that till the last hour, um, whether it be on September 30th or October 31st. Well said, Diego. You know, nothing like an enchilada to get me moving as well, sir. So um, I, I certainly appreciate the ingenuity with your outreach. Now, Charlotte, if you can touch on, uh, on that same question, and then I have another one that's more pointed uh, towards your um, expertise and your responsibilities um, and what I've learned from you throughout the years. What we learned in 2010 was the census significantly undercounted American Indians and Alaska Natives living on tribal lands by nearly 5%. Now, that may not sound like a lot to some, but in New Mexico, that translated to $217 million in lost funding over 10 years, or roughly $10 million per tribe. What more can we do across the United States and even in the closing week to ensure a complete count on tribal lands, including your thoughts on trying to still push to get that deadline extended another month, which is going to be tough. But what are your thoughts? Well, um, if it's extended, it uh, occurs to us, we've discussed this uh, at length, uh, that we're doing in the communities, they're doing so much to increase the self-response uh, rate to, in other words, to get us and our households to be the ones to call, do, complete it by mail, or to do it online. And so for people who don't, who choose, uh, who haven't, for whatever reason, completed their census, the enumerators, the next operation is the non-response follow-up enumeration phase. And so what we found there is that enumerators are hard to come by. Uh, that uh, they have been short in some areas uh, in uh, throughout New Mexico. So what extending the enumeration phase to um, to October, the extending the deadline to October 31 would allow that to happen and um, for the non-response follow-up enumeration to take place. There's a better chance that way to reach 100% and a complete and accurate count. So we are, we're still working. We're gonna to continue to work <coughs> right up to the end as well. Um, but I think that's that's one of the major pieces. Um, and was there an other, another aspect of your question that I didn't get to? I think you touched on it because in the previous, you, you chatted a bit about some of the tools that you had used and. I think that Matilda also shared a bit about some of those practices, like I asked Diego. So I think you covered it, Charlotte. Okay, good. Yeah. So Matilda, um, how did Hemis Pueblo's Complete Count Committee um, use its funds to deliver such a high response rate during the pandemic? You talked about uh, some of those programs, um, like the incentives, but did you hire a team? Um, what did you do at the beginning of this initiative uh, to prepare, to build your team, and to build the program uh, with being able to take advantage of the importance of those funds to deliver such a high self-response rate during the pandemic? Well, actually, I kind of had an advantage. I, um, Since I do the tribal enrollment, um, I have a enrollment committee that I just endorse, and uh, our uh, tribal specialists said that was fine because you know how census is so sensitive and confidential my committee was already used to that type of activity so they were in they were brought over to assist but as I was talking with Monica earlier with the lockdown it has been very hard for at least four of our members to participate because they have to cross the checkpoint to get to our office to even uh, assist us. And if it's not a good reason, they're not going to let them go. So it's mainly three of us that were doing a lot of the work. But they did uh, help us a lot and... Um, you know, I don't know what I'd do without them. Uh, yes. And they're all very, nice very willing. Difference, it sounds like. Huh? That early investment sounds like it made a big difference. 
Yes, it did, because they were already in the field of working with confidentiality. And then when uh, Amber came to do our uh, CCC training, she gave them the, you know, how we have to be sworn in and whatnot. So everything kind of just fell in place. And the really important thing about Hamas is, you know, we uh, our government is run by uh, the uh, Kasikis uh, point the people to be the governor, the aides, the lieutenants. They were not released from 2019. They continued on to 2020. And that was a big, big help for me too because Second Lieutenant Alston Yepa and uh, First Lieutenant John Galvan had already started attending some of these meetings that were held for the 19 Pueblos Agency or whatnot. So they were very, very aware of what was going on. So up to, to, to this date, they have been telling me, okay, we need a flyer, we need a flyer. So it's just been teamwork, I guess, okay? Well, Matilda, I think that says a lot about you where you're recognizing the leadership of the caciques and the governor and lieutenant governor and how you were a team in getting this done. Um, but I, I will say, Matilda, uh, you deserve a lot of credit um, and all the credit for the work you did and your incredible leadership for driving the count um, to the numbers that we have. And there's a lot that we have, a, have to learn from you. And I think that we can also uh, make sure that we learn from you so that we can share um, in anticipation of the next census to document your success. And that way we can make sure that there's that support that you needed that you showed when it's delivered, that we can eliminate that 5% undercount that we saw in 2010 and we can continue to make progress. So I look forward to learning that from you and from Charlotte so that way we can share that with others. Now, Diego, it's incredible how, how the time goes by Charlotte and Matilda. Um, you know, we're already like 45 minutes in and we, we asked for about 45 minutes of your time. Um, so I wanted to ask Diego one more question and then ask Charlotte and Matilda maybe just to share some closing thoughts. Um, but Diego, one of the questions that we keep getting in the, in the district office is a concern that there's still fear and misinformation in some communities about filling out the census. Um, particularly in immigrant communities. What should mixed status and immigrant households know about their rights and privacy protections when it comes to the census? And you're muted, Diego. <laughs> oh, we're still muted there. Let's see. Can we get Diego unmuted? Can you send him a... Invite to unmute. There we go. Thank you, Congressman. I'm sorry. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. There still is a fear and a lot of misinformation out there. Um, a lot of it by design, a lot of it calculated. Um, it's very important that we educate our communities um, at a very young age. We're working in our communities to add a civil um, component to the history classes in the elementary schools to educate our population as to the importance and the guidelines and how the census works, how vital and critical not only is it to our community, but um, how critical it is to maintain our political representation such as yourself. And um, we hear it all the time. Um, we've heard comments that jury duty is um, selected through the census um, data that is collected, which couldn't be any further from the truth. That's a state function or a county function, not a federal function. So um, it's extremely important that we educate our communities, especially those from migrant communities, that um, their information is safe and secure. They will not be subject to any reporting to law enforcement or any federal um, agency. And um, we need to do our best, as you said, to um, maintain what we currently have and do everything we can to improve on those things. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. And Diego, it's my understanding that that data is protected for like 72 years, right? Once you get a census count, it's protected for over seven decades. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we, we lost you on the mute again, Diego. 
Yes, sir. Uh, yes, yeah, 72 years is um, the time frame for which that data is protected. Well, that's and, um, insurance right there, right? Um, yes, I'm sir. Around in 72 years, brother, that would mean I'm like 120. <laughs> so I think that there's some assurances there. So I appreciate that. Um, so um, Charlotte, uh, any closing thoughts that you have for everyone as we just conclude this important conversation on census and encouraging people where they can go and maybe just another reminder for those that joined um, later in the conversation where they can go to fill out their census uh, or what tools they have at their disposal. Sure, I'll start with that actually first. Then you have three ways to complete the census. You got a form in the mail or at your doorstep uh, to complete. You can send that back by mail. You can use that information to complete it by um, online. And you can also, there is also a number there that you can call and forgive me, I don't have that, but we're gonna add that to the chat box here. Monica, uh, uh, please add that to the chat box. So that way we can show everyone. Thank you, Monica, thank yeah. you so much. And so uh, those are the three ways you can do this. Um, uh, before I go any further uh, either, I'd also like to make sure to extend our appreciation to the tribal partnership specialists. Every complete count committee, just about uh, every uh, across the state had partnership specialists that were there to guide them. Ours were exceptional. So I just like to give a, uh, acknowledge the work by Amber Carrillo and Kenny Penn who served. And then we had um, uh, Dr. Moore who assisted uh, Mescalero Apache and the Isleto del Sur communities. But um, I think that's really important. I'd also like to, extend the thanks to our tribal leaders, as was mentioned before. So finally, my thoughts are, you know, there's like three Ds for me. This is kind of how I break it down. Dollars, or data, dollars, and districts. And of course, that's short for redistricting. But um, it's representation, political representation, that's also a key part of the data collected here. So um, one key thing as well that I'd like to take away uh, for all of us to take away is that um, we're going to use the information, the experience that we've had. The pandemic has definitely been a tough, uh, a tough uh, experience. However, we've learned so much by it that we're going to be able to carry into other efforts such as getting out the vote. Uh, all of the, the change-ups that we've had to make because of the delays, because of the uh, safety factors that are involved, that's going to be key. We brought away quite a bit of information. So that's one of the positives that I look at. Finally, I'll just say, if you haven't completed your census, get it done tonight. 15 minutes max. Uh, have the, the ages of the people who are in your household uh, if you're a grandma and you're uh, filling it out for your family, you want to get their names, their ages, and their birth dates. So having those pieces of information, if you collect it, is just really helpful, help you get it done really quickly. Otherwise, you know, we'll be asking. And your, your birth date is on when? <laughs> what year were you born? So it just makes it, simplifies it a little bit to, to get it done in less than 15 minutes. And if you're in the house together, do it right now. Just come together. Right now. Yep. Um, and just know that you're uh, securing investments for New Mexico. That's why it matters so very much. Um, oh, thanks yeah. for that, Charlotte. Um, so welcome. look, uh, to everyone, I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists who joined us tonight. Diego Trujillo, Charlotte Little, Matilda Shendo. Um, it's such an honor to, to be with you all. Look, the census determines how $1.5 trillion is allocated to communities across the country. $70 billion in federal funding for New Mexico hangs in the balance. Think about that. And for every 1% that we don't get counted, it's a loss of $780 million per year. So just think about all those important dollars that we're fighting for in our communities to invest in our schools, after school programs, infrastructure projects, cl closing that broadband divide, especially with grants. Now this includes a loss of $210 million over the next 10 years right here in the third congressional district if we fail to just uh, have a 1% undercount in the next seven days. $210 million is what's on the hook for every 1% we don't get counted. And again, the deadline is September 30th. 
So let's please spread the word. Um, I want to thank my team. Um, there's there are going to be several phone banks going on, and I know that Diego, Charlotte, and Matilda, they're part of those phone banks. Uh, we're going to be participating in those phone banks. Please spread the word. This is important. Uh, remember what Diego said, if you walked by a $10 bill every day, uh, you would pick it up. So th that's the same thing that you're doing here for people across New Mexico. And I think we got that 1-800 number up, uh, Charlotte, but it's 844-330-2020. That's 844-330-2020. Or again, the website, everyone should know this, my2020census.gov. So please fill it out. Now, if you have any questions, uh, you can go to, uh, to my website tonight and all this information is there. And that website is lujan.house.gov. That's L-U-J-A-N dot house, H-O-U-S-E dot gov, G-O-V. Or you can call my Santa Fe office, 505-984-8950. Um, when you go to my website, you can sign up for the newsletter as well. Make sure that you sign up, we'll keep you informed. And everyone just please continue to follow those public health orders. Uh, please continue to wear a mask in public, practice social distancing, avoid large groups, make sure you wash your hands. And again, to our three incredible panelists tonight, thanks for being a part of this. And everyone, you have a wonderful and a safe night. And uh, we look forward to catching up with you soon um, on our next telephone town hall or video conference. Uh, thanks again, everyone. You have a wonderful night. Take care. Thank you, Representative. Bye-bye.